Aren't you happy to be back in Texas? I am, though. <laughs> so this is the first case we've worked on where we have two victims. A husband and wife. On the morning of September the 27th, 1997, 16-year-old Tiffany called the police saying that she found her father, Charlie, and her stepmother, Kathy, bloodied and beaten to death. Crazy to think that two people in their house would end up being killed the way they were. With a hammer, of all things, seems so personal. They were beaten so badly that they first thought they were shot. Rumors quickly spread as to who could have wanted such a happy couple dead. There was an issue with the cousin. It felt like you have blood on his hands. Last thing I need is pigs coming around my house, and it's freaking me out. I still believe that it was Tiffany. At the center of the rumors was Charlie's own daughter, Tiffany, who claimed to have slept through the whole thing and was the only person the killer left alive. Was she so mad at her dad and her stepmom that she would kill them like that? Unfortunately, with the lack of evidence and police resources, the case went cold. I'm excited looking at this hammer because it's never really been looked at by the lab. Kelly and I have read over the entire case, but there's still a lot to learn. We've called in the big guns on this one, Houston homicide detectives Alan Brown and Johnny Bonds. With their help, our goal is to convince the district attorney to file capital murder charges on the person or persons who killed Charlie and Kathy. It has been 16 years and still no answers. At least consider her killing a cold case. Years later, the case is still unsolved. There are so many cold cases out there just waiting to be solved. The crime scene ultimately tells the story of the murder. We want to bring justice to these victims. bring you to meet some more of my people. <laughs> no, wait a minute. The whole state of Texas cannot be your people. They're all my people. They're all your people. <laughs> hey, guys. Look who's here. Hello, ladies. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Hey. Yolanda, this is Tammy. Hi. Hi. Nice, nice to, to meet, meet you. you. And this is Danny Jones. Hi, Yolanda. Hi. Nice, nice to, to meet you. you. Every cop probably has a case that he will remember throughout his career. And this one's mine. The murder happened? 16 years ago tomorrow. And you were there that day? Yes. It was one of my first homicides as a detective where the, all the responsibility was thrown upon me to solve this case. Well, we all read it. We're all excited. Us too. LaPorte is not the type of town that has a lot of violent crime. It's very rare. And so when you have a double homicide, it just gets everybody all scared. Well, show us the room. Let's go start You ready? Talking. Right this way. Why don't we start with y'all talking about the victims? Charles and Kathy Hayes, they were in their mid-30s at the time they were killed. And they grew up in LaPorte, huh? Yes. High school sweethearts? Right. And right. hooked back up later on. Charlie was a musician, had had his own band and played in local bars and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. He had worked at a uh, small engine repair shop, and they had one daughter together, Samantha, who was seven. Did you make a wish? Yay! Then Charlie had uh, another daughter that was living at the house named Tiffany, who was 16. <laughs> I got the phone call uh, shortly after 5 in the morning. When I arrived, Charlie, who was not yet deceased, had been located in a recliner that was fully reclined and had severe head trauma. EMS had already removed him from the living room, and he was transported downtown to Herman Hospital. But I did I approach Kathy. She had extreme injuries to her head. Her shirt, and it was kind of crumpled up. She was also dressed in some sweatpants, and those had been pulled down to her ankles. With Kathy's pants pulled down and the bruises on her knees, it was thought that this might be a possible rape. But that was later tossed out when testing showed no signs of sexual assault. We know that both of them were killed by a hammer. The day after the murder, the detectives located the murder weapon in a culvert right by the house. Later, the hammer was identified as belonging to the victims. Where was Tiffany? According to Tiffany, she was in her bedroom. 
Tiffany was the only person left in the house that night because Samantha had slept over at her grandmother's house. But strangely, Tiffany was left unharmed. Uh, and then she wakes up around 5 a.m. to what she thought was her father snoring. And actually, when she goes in there, immediately sees something's wrong and calls 911. What was your emergency? Yes, my parents are sitting here with blood everywhere. On both of them? On both of them. Okay, so then y'all talked about a couple of suspects. Tiffany, I think anyone that first looks at this case says, well, how did she sleep through that? You know, we considered the fact if Tiffany was involved, maybe it was Brian, her boyfriend. Because if she didn't have the guts to do it but wanted it done, it could have been her boyfriend. The next phone call she makes after 911, she is calling Brian. Some say Kathy and Charlie wanted those two to break up. They didn't want her to travel down this road. Which could be his motive. If they're disapproving and they want Absol him and they wanted him life. gone. Now they're married to each other. And have four children. Wow. Okay, so if it's not Tiffany or Brian, then who else are we looking at? According to Tiffany, when she went to sleep around midnight, Charlie was already undressed and in his bed. And later, of course, when he's discovered, he's dressed in black colored Levi jeans. It's very possible Charlie could have got up and allowed the killer inside. I mean, he obviously got up and got dressed for a reason. Maybe someone came over and visited, and maybe they, I mean, we know that there's rolled marijuana joints in the ashtray. We, we showed Tiffany pictures and pointed out that there are pillows on the couch, and she's saying that was not there when I went to bed. Really? All right, so who would Charlie have let inside? Craig Hauser. Craig. He's a relative of Charlie. Right. He's Is Charlie's it a first cousin, cousin or cousin. second cousin? Right. What's his reputation around town? Alcohol and drug issues. He's got a short fuse, huh? Yes. Anger issues. Anger short... issues. What about um, his crush on Kathy? Lust. Yeah. At the time of the murder, his, his mother lived within a half mile. So that's walking distance. Yes. The last one we got up here is Paul Salazar. And we get his name because of Wanda Spiller who did live right there in the neighborhood, who says right around 4, 4.30 in the morning, she sees Paul, who she knows, running around, and it kind of freaked her out. In the report, this says that Charlie had the disagreement with someone at the lawnmower shop, and Paul Salazar worked at the lawnmower shop. And it was a Hispanic male that he had the, the disagreement with. And so the question is, is drinking and maybe using dope going to be enough to make him snap and kill? You said Tiffany's got four kids? Yes, her and Brian. Wow. We need to be cautious talking to Tiffany because we don't know if she's involved in her parents' murders or if she's just an innocent victim. Luckily, she and her half-sister, Samantha, are really eager to meet with us. But we're going to have Johnny Bonds listen in in the car. Can you tell us anything about your dad, about your mom? You probably have a lot always, of stories. Always, always, <laughs> always happiness. Just the music, constantly say, music. I oh, music. I remember the, the music room and being a kid and, you know, running out there, and it was amazing. You know, since it happened, it's just been rough. I want, I wish year after year that they were here with me. If we were able to have answers to this, I don't even think any words could describe the feelings that we would all feel. Samantha has never been told the details of the crime scene because Tiffany has always wanted to protect her sister from all that. But we need to ask her some other questions, too, so you don't need to hear all that right now. But in order to solve this case, we have to find out as many details as we can. As much as you can remember, kind of start with that night. I've always been a deep sleeper. And I just remember waking up, and I heard just this weird breathing. So I get up. And I'm rubbing my eyes, rubbing my eyes, and I'm like, oh my gosh. I walk around, and as I'm rubbing my eyes, I slip in her pool of blood and almost fell down. And she's right there, just laying there. So I call 911. After I dial 911, I turn around, and I just see everything. I, I just see it, and I know this is bad. And I remember at some point I knelt down to tell the operator and I felt her, I think it was her back, and she's not breathing. I want to check and see if she has a pulse. Oh, I don't want to. Oh, man. Oh, poor Kathy. 
And then I turned to my dad, I put my hand on his chest, and I said, he's still breathing, he's still breathing. And shortly after that, the officer knocked on the door. Ma'am, are the officers in the house? They are. Okay, I'll let you go. Okay. Okay, um, new subject. Craig Hauser mm -hmm. is your dad's second cousin? Yeah, he's cousin. And the first time he sees you and talks to you after everything happened, what was that like? It was at the fairgrounds. There's a booth set up, and I had volunteered for this certain booth, and I'm walking towards the booth, and Craig is coming at me. And he said, are you going to give me a hug, or do I have to beat you to death? What did you say to him? Um, I just sat there. I didn't know what to say. He didn't say anything else? He didn't say anything else. And in, in all the years, has he said anything else? We haven't talked to him. What, what, do you, what are your thoughts about him? You know, I don't want a false accuse because I know what that feels like. What does it feel like? It's terrible. I lost part of my family. I didn't know Samantha for years. So I don't ever want to put that on somebody else that I say, I think you did it because it hurts too much. It's just awful. At this point, it's difficult to say. Either Tiffany had nothing to do with the murders or she's been lying so long she believes it herself. Assistant Chief Parker is here today because he was one of the first responders to the scene. He's going to help us understand what they saw that day. We actually pulled up, and then pretty quick, uh, Tiffany opened the door. And she appeared to be pretty pristine, and I could see her father right here at the corner. This house is pretty small, with two bedrooms in the back and a living room and a kitchen in the front area. Charlie was found in the living room, while Kathy was found lying face down near the dining area. So we had to get help for Charlie because he was still breathing, obviously still alive. She was obviously dead on the scene. Yeah, she's like, like her head is up into the wood area. Yeah, I remember her, her a ears. huge pool of blood right here. So you're thinking this happened mm -hmm. when? I think time-wise, with his injuries, the fact that he lived it all for minutes, it happened more towards the morning. Oh, yeah. Look at the He's blood force yeah. trauma. He's still alive. Because if it was 1 or 2 in the morning, he, he would have breathed he that long. He would have expired. Been. None of us believe that Tiffany, if she was involved, would have been the actual one to swing the hammer. So that leaves Tiffany's boyfriend, Brian, Charlie's cousin, Craig Hauser, or Charlie's co-worker, Paul Salazar. We, we don't know how the killer got in or when he came in, but we know before he killed anybody, he had to get the hammer. And we know the hammer was on top of the refrigerator. Refrigerator's right here. He gets the hammer. Charlie was in that recliner. His head was right about here. Yes. So our killer comes beside him, and he's hitting Charlie at least 14 times. And I mean, these are vicious strikes. He gets through. He's going to have blood all over him. Mm -hmm. He walks back in here. He sets the hammer down on the mat. We know that he set the hammer down, because yeah. it's traced out with the blood and everything. But he does that after she's dead. No, before. No, before. before. This is his blood only. When the investigators tested the blood, that was a transfer from the hammer onto the placemat. It exclusively came back to Charlie. So that means Charlie was attacked before Kathy. And then all of a sudden, she comes out. Then he sees her, and he's like, oh my god. She realizes something's wrong. She goes to leave. Oh, no, you don't. I got your shirt. I'm yanking you back. You're trying to get away. You're trying to get away. I got your pants. I'm trying to reach for this hammer. And she's trying to get away. And she actually crawls out of her pants. So her pants are around her ankles now. Oh, here's the knee spray. Look, 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 look. Yeah, yeah. Here's the knee spray. Yes, yep, and yep, you yep. come out of your pants. OK. You go down. But now I'm hitting you. Some of these are actually coming through, because there's like two marks on the wall there. So he's, he's beating her when she's down. down. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. And she does bring up her arm once. She's got a perfect circle mark with that, that hammer hit her in the arm. Defensively. Then he goes to the bathroom. He goes in here. We got blood in, in front of the sink. 
wash his, probably his hands, probably his face, and the hammer. Then he leaves. He still got the hammer in his hand, and he doesn't even shut the door behind him. Nope, he leaves he it leaves. in the jar. I mean, seriously, that what y'all just did was very impressive. It makes perfect sense to me. It also says okay. that we have a killer who knows where the hammer is, yes. who knows how to find the bathroom. This is a small house, and Tiffany's bedroom was just feet away from where her parents were killed. It's hard to imagine that she didn't hear these attacks at all, but it's possible. A killer comes out, he's got the hammer in his hand, goes out through this gate, and we know he goes to this intersection. And it's, what, 5 o'clock in the morning or so, so yep. it's still dark. And he doesn't stick this in here. He threw it up there. Because it was, what, a good 10 feet in there? At least, yeah. How'd y'all find it? We were desperate. Checking trash cans, culverts, ditches, everything around Good here. Good for you, man. The location of the hammer suggests a route that leads directly to two of our suspects. We know that Salazar lived to the to the left up here, just about three blocks away. And straight ahead down this street is where Craig Hauser's mother lived. Right, right. All right, let's go drive it. Where's the Salazar compound? We'll show you. According to a neighbor, Paul Salazar was seen banging on doors about 4 o'clock that morning, which is just around the time we think the murder could have occurred. There they are, right there. He also possibly had a prior altercation with Charlie at that lawnmower shop where they both worked. You were working at the lawnmower shop with, with Charlie Hayes. Yes. Did y'all ever have a disagreement between no. the two of you? No. He told his daughter he had a disagreement with a Hispanic male that worked at the lawnmower shop. I was the only Hispanic male there. But I never seen him have a disagreement. Okay. The day the murders happened. Wanda Spiller, Wanda, and yeah. she's dead now, and she made a sworn affidavit, and she swore you were there between 4 and 4.30 in the morning. She's asleep in the car. You're banging on Hell's door. I, I didn't have a watch on me either, but no. I don't think it was that late. Paul is denying everything. He's saying that he and Charlie were buddies and was home that night hours before our crime ever even took place. But I heard that the boyfriend had been missing. And... Yeah, nobody's ever been arrested. Well, I thought all this was done. There have been rumors of Tiffany and Brian's involvement in this crime for 16 years. Hey, I'm Kelly. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Mind if we talk to you for a minute? Sure, that'd be fine. What we need to do is track down any person we can find who might have witnessed firsthand any altercations between Charlie and Brian and Tiffany in the weeks leading up to the murder. I can't say because I don't know the actual evidence of, of what happened, but I did hear that uh, Charlie was did not agree with with the boyfriend Tiffany had chosen. I've heard some hearsay from from other people. Is that the week before Kathy and Charlie died, Tiffany had told him that she was going to get married to Brian, and Charlie told her over my dead body. I heard that Tiffany and were having sex, and they were confronted about it, and that Charlie and Kathy did not want Tiffany seeing Brian. Huh? The best of my recollection, mm -hmm. Charlie was not real happy with Brian uh, there near the end. Everybody is eager to share what they've heard. Who did you hear that from? I'm not exactly sure. But so far, it's mostly rumors and hearsay. She gets on the phone to call Brian, not 911, is what I was told. Who told you that? Somebody did. I don't remember. Somebody yeah, died. somebody told us. In the legal world, it's called hearsay, and it's inadmissible because it's not firsthand information. Well, we weren't there. For it to be admissible, it has to be what somebody saw with their own eyes or heard with their own ears. This is your quote. Brian's relationship with both of them was good, and they approved of the relationship. Kind of the opposite of what you're saying now, and that's why I'm wondering if this is stuff you picked up after they were murdered. Right, right. And maybe you're right. Having solid witness testimony is not only the key to building an airtight case, it's also the best way to find the truth. Well, any, anything else along those lines, any behavior that you witnessed? Um, the weekend before they died, there was an issue with the cousin. Craig. Craig, Craig Hauser? Yeah. Charlie and, and Craig were arguing about a, borrowing a car. And Craig blew up. Was he yelling? And it was, it was, he threw the keys. Yeah, he almost hit our daughter with the keys. Did you recall that maybe Hauser had some inappropriate feelings toward Kathy? He kissed her in he front was, of me. He kissed, kissed Kathy in front of me. He kissed her in the mouth. That's what Kathy told you, right? That's what Kathy told me. Okay. Now we're...
starting to get some first-hand information. Basically, Charlie had a rule. No men in his house when he's not at home. And Craig, was, he was at the house when Charlie wasn't home, and he was upset about it. Basically, Charlie ejected him from the yard. Craig was there this Yes. Year? And it was over Kathy? Yeah. So it's kind of all coming to a boil. It if is. you think about it. It is. He's Craig Hauser out, can't see Kathy. He gives her this kiss. There's a fight. He cuts it off. It's coming to yeah, a boil. Where Charlie, I think, kicked him out for good. Yep, and he couldn't take that. He couldn't stand the fact that he couldn't see her anymore. And nobody tells him what to do. Exactly. The story about Charlie's fight with Craig in the weeks before the murder could be critical to this case. We've heard there's another man who might have more first-hand information about that. Are you Chuck? Chuck Johnny Bonds. And we've heard that he hangs out at a local bar. I was standing there when Charlie kicked his ass and threw him over the fence, and Craig told him right straight then, I'll kill you. You heard that? I heard that. You saw it and heard it? I witnessed that. Straight up, point blank, no doubt, no ifs, ands, or buts, I'll kill your ass. We've got more indicators all pointing toward Craig Hauser, but before we can go there, we need to verify Brian's alibi. Remember on the night of the murders, yourself and some other people were at James Stanzik's apartment? Yeah. Brian has always claimed that he slept over at a friend's house, and he didn't leave there until 5 a.m. because he had to go home and mow his mom's yard. Did uh, Brian stay there all night? I'm pretty sure Brian was there all night with us. OK. Do you remember him leaving? Do you remember Brian leaving? I know he left to go back to my parents' house because he had to go mow their grass or right. something in the morning. Like 5 o'clock in the morning? Yeah, he, he wanted a ride or something, and I couldn't give him a ride. Did he not have a car? Did Brian, Brian not? did not have a car. Richard Rogers and Brian's brother's stories match their original statements. Now it's time to talk to Brian. Let's hear his story of what happened that night, and let's hear what we think about him. Did Charlie ever have one of these come to Jesus talks to you about Tiffany, about boy, that's my daughter? Oh, no. <laughs> there wasn't ever any conflict? No, but, you know, no, because we, we were buds. I think he knew we were right for each other. You know, we all had that understanding. You know, we didn't try to do anything inappropriate in the house or anything like that. You know, well, we actually, well, actually, I think somebody said that he asked you not to disrespect his house. Disrespect his house? By having sex with his daughter in the house. No, I don't recall that. <laughs> so tell me signs of deception-wise, the way he's kicked back in the chair and all that. Can't... As a cop, what are y'all seeing? Y'all never had a, a, a conflict at all. No, he was like Skipper and I was like Gilligan. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much the way we rolled. I was his little buddy, you know. He's kind of stretched out, looks pretty good. You're not reading anything funny. Yeah, he looks If relaxed. he knows something, he tells you, and if he doesn't, he tells you. He seems pretty honest about it. I know that this is over your head for the last 16 years. Yeah. Uh, how's that affected you? I mean, it's, you know, we lost so many friends in the process, and that's the painful thing. You know, all the people we used to hang out with just turned their backs to us, gave us the cold eye, man, and we lost pretty much everybody. We've spoken to everybody in the world of Brian and Tiffany, and it's time for us to make a decision about their involvement. OK, so let's look at Tiffany, everybody. She didn't wake up. Probably the luckiest thing ever happened in her life. It's a good thing that Tiffany didn't wake up that night. That's a good point. If she did it, why would she call if her father's still alive? She doesn't know he won't live and say she did it. You sure he's breathing? He's got a heart for you, Daddy! Daddy! Whoever did this would have blood all over them. She didn't have any she blood on her. She has yeah. nothing on her. She appeared to be pretty pristine. Now we go over here to Brian. Nobody actually says they hear Kathy or Charlie say, we told Brian he couldn't come around anymore. Charlie didn't tell you that he doesn't want Brian to come over anymore. And this is all hearsay. I, I mean, oh, OK. OK, alibied out. That's definitely cleared up. Mm -hmm. I didn't think he had a guilty bone in his no. body. So. And nor do I. Tiffany not only lost her parents, but she and Brian have been the victims of rumors and suspicions for the last 16 years. 16 years later. Yeah. So when all those people that all these years have been thinking that they did it, now y'all can go tell them all they were wrong. We're now down to two suspects. We don't have a lot of information pointing to Paul Salazar, so we're going to focus our investigation on Craig Hauser. I think if Craig Hauser did this, I think Donald Reed knows it. 
According to Craig's statement, on the night of the murder, he and his stepbrother Donald went out drinking and stayed at a local hotel called Grumpy's. The next morning, they checked out of a hotel and moved to a new one in Sugarland, where they were going to be working construction. So now I would like to see what Donald Reed has to say about that night. Okay. So y'all were staying in Grumpy's Motel. Yeah. Y'all being out at some club. Texas Saloon. You remember that? Yeah, because Tanya had just came back around. OK, so she was your girlfriend. Oh, yeah. OK. And I told them to take the van. You're talking about Craig? Craig. And the next morning, when you got, up, got out of bed to go to work, was Craig in the room with you? No, I was with Tanya. So after Texas Saloon, you didn't see him till he arrived in Sugarland. Yeah, and I believe he was late getting there. My God, he completely destroys Craig Hauser's alibi. Hauser says he went back to the motel and spent the night with Donald at Grumpy's Motel, and Donald says he didn't come back at all. How long has it been since you've talked to Craig? Probably six to eight months. He came up here. Walked to my door, drunk as hell, first thing. Hey, man, you got a place I can lay up and sleep? And I'm thinking, you mother I ain't seen you in years. And you come straight here to my house and want a place to lay down and sleep? Really? Yeah. He said that Craig did not come back. He didn't see Craig till the next day in Sugar Lane. Yeah, that's sweet. And he's never said that before. No. Beautiful. So not only did Donald destroy mm. Craig's alibi, I'm thinking that his story of Craig showing up at his house, unannounced, drunk, looking for a place to crash, sounds a lot like our crime scene. We have a lot of clues pointing toward the involvement of Craig Hauser in the 1997 murder of Charlie and Kathy Hayes. So today we're headed to Arkansas to track him down and try and get a DNA sample because that's never been done before. See what he has to say and compare it to his statement in 97. Craig's alibi has always been that he and Donald Reed spent the night at a hotel nearby called Grumpy's before leaving the next morning for a new hotel in Sugarland. But according to Donald Reed's statements today, that is not true. On that night that they were killed, because I'm, I'm kind of new to this, on that night, run me back through. You I were was staying at a hotel. I can't tell you the name of it. Yeah. Me and my stepbrother. Donald Wayne Reed's his name. OK. And we were there in a hotel room in uh, Sugar Land. We know from the hotel records that Craig did not check into that hotel in Sugarland until the day after the murder. Either he's remembering that incorrectly or he's lying. There's some people that said that, that maybe you and Kathy had had an affair. Is there any no, truth to that? No. Y'all y'all never had any type of relationship no. or anything? Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Did you ever actually live in that house? No. Or, or did I stay was, for a length of time a week or we something? We were there all the time doing all that music recording. I mean, shoot, I was probably there seven, eight hours a day, every day almost. Oh, OK. Yeah. Whenever you slept over there, whenever you stayed the night, where would you sleep at? They had a couch right yeah. there in the front room. Didn't you and Charlie have a fight or something? It wasn't a fight. There was never a fist thrown, nothing like that. Charlie never knocked you to the ground or anything no. outside? Charlie and I never, ever got into a physical altercation ever in our life. All right. Appreciate it, Mr. Howard. Hey, so did y'all ever get anything from Tiffany or her husband? You know how people talk, and, right. and we got to filter through what's the truth and what isn't the truth. All right. It's no surprise that Craig denied everything, but the very first cold case that I ever worked, I learned that the best way to solve a cold case is by finding the most important people in their lives after the murder happened. So the agenda today is to find all the women who have ever dated, flirted with, kissed, drank a beer with, had sex with, or God forbid, been married to Craig Hauser. There was a time you were separated from your husband, I believe, and that you actually dated Craig Hauser? anything, not until I was in Houston, go, going to Houston with him, and all of a sudden, he said, now look, if I get pulled over, they might put me in jail. I said, what are you, what are you talking about, or whatever, and he goes, well, they think I had uh, something to do with murdering these people, and he went, like, uh, telling me how they found the bodies, and I was just, like, so scared. 
he said the man was sitting in a recliner and someone had come from behind and just hit him a bunch of times. A bunch of times? A bunch of times. He said that? He said that. Attacked from behind mm -hmm. while sitting in the recliner is not public knowledge. So just that one statement alone is the one detail of the scene that no one would know but the police. Killers always tell somebody. They either cry about it or they brag about it. Sometimes both, depending on who they're trying to impress. Or intimidate. Yeah. Some of his relatives never did believe him. You know, he just kept insisting at that point that he was just there, he had nothing to do with it. He woke up and how tragic it was for him to, to see them. Okay, so he told you he was there, he woke up and they were dead. What brought that conversation up? He would know? have nightmares at night sometimes and he'd wake up and say that he felt like he had blood on his hands and he just didn't know what was real and what wasn't anymore. Or did he say anything about the weapon? He said that he had blood on his hands. He was trying to throw it away. It's not a confession, but it's an admission that he was yeah, there. Yeah, and apparently uh, Craig's conscience isn't quite as clear as we thought it was. I thought it was going to be a feather day. We finally got some chicken. Yeah. <laughs> It seems like Craig has made some slips over the years, and we want to catch him red-handed. So we want to use his old buddy, Donald Reed, to try and get him to say some things he might have never said before. Tell you what, we take him a bottle of Patron and he'll make any phone call we want him to. Hey, Don. You've been very helpful, and I'm going to ask you if you do something else, and you don't have to do it, but I'm going to ask you if you do it. What's that? I want you to call him. What? And just tell him that we called you, and we'll come back up here to talk to you. I have no problem doing that at all. And wire up your phone. And we can listen in, so, OK. Donald's more than happy to help us out. I just hope he can sound convincing. Otherwise, it's going to be a bust if Craig knows that he's faking it. Yeah, you talk just like you'd normally talk to him. And, and well, again, I think, I, I think he. I think always talk, because he'll know exactly what I come up with. I think you being a little pissed that we're coming back might be appropriate. Yeah, yeah I do, too. There it goes. Hey, Hey, Hey. Um. You heard anything more about the cops coming around you? No, but I don't understand what they're dealing. I really don't. Well, let me tell you something. They came to my house again. Oh, they did? Yeah, they sure did. And I don't know what the f's up, but you know, I just got out of prison, dude. And uh, last thing I need is pigs coming around my house, and it's freaking me out. No, it's freaking me out. Where did you meet me at? Did you come to the job site? Did you meet me at the hotel? I mean, I'm, I can't remember 16 years ago, bro. And I get f***ing nervous. I don't remember being at Grumpy's with you and Tony. I thought I was already at the hotel in Sugarland. Hell, I don't know, bro. How would you be at the hotel in Sugarland if we hadn't gone to Sugarland yet? I don't know. That's, I'm, I'm, that's what I'm saying. They're barking up the wrong tree anyway. Yeah. I didn't have nothing to do with it. All right. We'll holler at you later. Craig Hauser has now given us three different stories about where he was the night of the murder. In 1997, he said he stayed at Grumpy's Hotel. A few days ago, he told us he stayed at a different hotel in Sugarland. And today, he's saying he doesn't remember where he was. So we might not have gotten the confession we were hoping for, but all of these new inconsistencies helped build a circumstantial case. We don't want to write up the probable cause yet. Let's wait and see what the DNA results say. All right, the first thing is the hammer is inconclusive, but we figured that was a huge possibility because we know that hammer was rinsed Washed. off in that scene. 
the white t-shirt, the panties, and then we got her sweatpants. All three of these are extremely weak, which means basically they're useless. We were all hoping to get DNA results from Kathy's clothing, especially where we know her shirt and her pants were grabbed by the suspect. Unfortunately, it came back far too weak to be able to ID our killer. On the marijuana cigarette, the one that was halfway smoked comes back to Paul Salazar. Definitely him, or cannot exclude him? Oh, it's definitely it's him. him. Holy it's him. Holy shit. On the whole cigarette is also Paul, with nobody else. So Paul's on both. Whoa. So that tells me the role of marijuana joints came from Paul. So maybe Charlie, you know, saw Paul earlier and, and picked up two joints. But then we're talking touch of DNA, But if he too. rolled the joints and sold it to him, he, it would be Paul Salazar's Absolutely, because he probably DNA licked it. On it. Which would mean he rolled them, which would mean he sold them. Hey. But again, what the heck, why hasn't he what? said that before? The DNA puts Paul Salazar with the joint, and even though that's no evidence that he's the killer, it does show that he's been lying to the police. He's been hanky since we've been here. He didn't want to cooperate, didn't want to come down here. He hadn't come down here. Right. He hadn't been down here. But he could be hinky because he knew he sold them dope. And he says he's only been inside their house one, one time. time. But he wouldn't have to be inside their house if he's just given Kathy some dope to smoke or Charlie. Yeah. Well, I think y'all need to get Paul Salazar down here and put him in the interrogation room and run at him the way you never have before. And show him the DNA report with his name on it and see what he says. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta accuse him of it. Yep. Yep. A hard interview. A hard interview for the first time. Yeah. Hey, Paul. I'm Alan Brown. How you doing, sir? I know you're a real busy guy, Paul, but it would really help us if we could go down to the office because we're going to have to clear some things up on your original statement. And I have some questions for you that I really need some honest answers on. I've been honest. I'm, oh, I know, oh, and I'm no, sure. Well, I, let me ask you this. Did you did you ever go inside Charlie's house and, like, smoke marijuana with Charlie? Well, it, it's okay. I mean, it, it, see, that's what I'm talking about. We need the truth. Did you sell marijuana to make extra money? <laughs> <laughs> let me get, let me just talk to an attorney. Okay? All right. No disrespect to y'all, okay? I just want to see where I'm, where I'm going with this. And I just want to make sure my ass is covered. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. This is serious. What's driving me crazy is that there is a perfectly valid, innocent explanation, but because Paul Salazar is afraid to talk to the police, a capital murder case could go unsolved. That's what's making me crazy. That's about the best I can do, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, how'd it go? So we uh, talked to the DA's office. They uh, think that uh, we have a good case. They issued us a grand jury subpoena for Paul Salazar, and it satisfied us subpoena by giving a statement to Mayor Danny. Perfect. All right, bye-bye. All right, bye. Nice. We all agree, after all that we've done this week, the evidence against Craig Hauser is huge. We have a killer who knows where the hammer is, yes. who knows how to find the bathroom. Down this street is where Craig Hauser's mother lived. Craig told him, I'll kill you. You heard that. No ifs, ands, or buts, I'll kill your ass. How would you be at the hotel in Sugarland if we hadn't gone to Sugarland yet? Did he say anything about the weapon? He said that he had blood on his hands. He was trying to throw it away. But we can't ask for his indictment until we can clear out this DNA on a marijuana cigarette belonging to Paul Salazar. This is the moment we always hate. I know, because there's nothing we can do about it but sit here and wait. I know. If Paul Salazar's explanation is perfectly innocent, then we're good. Hopefully it'll go well. Well, we're back. Hey. What happened? We met with Paul Salazar at his attorney's office. Uh, basically, Paul's explanation was several times he's given uh, Charlie or Kathy a joint. That was the reason that he was so hinky. He, you know, I guess thought we could file on him now for delivering okay. marijuana. So when we left there, we contacted the DA's office, and they were good with the explanation. Felt like it made sense, and that cleared him. And they've agreed to take to the grand jury and request an indictment on Craig Hauser for capital murder. Ha <laughs> ha!
that. That's awesome! For Samantha and Tiffany, I think just knowing who did this to their mom and their dad will at least relieve them of some of the pain they have felt all these years. You know, you can lose a parent and it can, it can affect you. But when you lose both parents and you're so young, it changes your whole world for the rest of your life. Everything changes. And that's what happened with these girls. Well, girls, Tammy's got some good news for y'all. We uh, talked to the DA's office, and they've agreed to uh, present the case to a grand jury and ask for a capital murder indictment on Craig Hauser. Oh, <laughs> you and Brian are absolutely cleared in everybody's minds. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that is awesome. The case is good. The case is strong. And now everybody who's ever looked at you and oh. thought you had anything to do with this is going to know that you did not. <laughs> I lost my whole world, and it's been really, really hard. I could never hurt my parents. I love them so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. For Tiffany to finally know that the whole world gets to hear that she had nothing to do with it and that the person who killed her dad and her stepmom is going to be held accountable has to be a good feeling. Oh, thank you so much. Finally. Yes, finally. If I had a chance to speak to them right now, all I could say was I love you. And I carry your music with me every day. Okay, so then y'all talked about a couple of suspects. Tiffany, I think anyone that first looks at this case says, well, how did she sleep through that? You know, we considered the fact if Tiffany was involved, maybe it was Brian, her boyfriend. Because if she didn't have the guts to do it but wanted it done, it could have been her boyfriend. The next phone call she makes after 911, she is calling Brian. Some say Kathy and Charlie wanted those two to break up. They didn't want her to travel down this road. Which could be his motive. If they're disapproving and they want Absol and they wanted them gone. Now they're married to each other. And have four children. Wow. OK, so if it's not Tiffany or Brian, then who else are we looking at? According to Tiffany, when she went to sleep around midnight, Charlie was already undressed and in his bed. And later, of course, when he's discovered, he's dressed in black colored Levi jeans. It's very possible Charlie could have got up and allowed the killer inside. I mean, he obviously got up and got dressed for a reason. Maybe someone came over and visited, and maybe they, I mean, we know that there was rolled marijuana joints in the ashtray. We, we showed Tiffany pictures and pointed out that there are pillows on the couch, and she's saying that was not there when I went to bed. Really? Yes. All right, so who would Charlie have let in? Call uh, shortly after 5 in the morning. When I arrived, Charlie, who was not yet deceased, had been located in a recliner that was fully reclined and had severe head trauma. EMS had already removed him from the living room, and he was transported downtown to Herman Hospital. But I did I approach Kathy. She had extreme injuries to her head. Her shirt, it was kind of crumpled up. She was also dressed in some sweatpants, and those had been pulled down to her ankles. With Kathy's pants pulled down and the bruises on her knees, it was thought that this might be a possible rape. But that was later tossed out when testing showed 
no signs of sexual assault. We know that both of them were killed by a hammer. The day after the murder, the detectives located the murder weapon in a culvert right by the house. Later, the hammer was identified as belonging to the victims. Where was Tiffany? According to Tiffany, she was in her bedroom. Tiffany was the only person left in the house that night because Samantha had slept over at her grandmother's house. But strangely, Tiffany was left unharmed. Uh, and then she wakes up around 5 AM to what she thought was her father snoring. And actually, when she goes in there, immediately sees something's wrong and calls 911. What is your emergency? Yes, my parents are Aren't you happy to be back in Texas? I am, though. <laughs> so this is the first case we've worked on where we have two victims. A husband and wife. On the morning of September the 27th, 1997, 16-year-old Tiffany called the police, saying that she found her father, Charlie, and her stepmother, Kathy, bloodied and beaten to death. What is your emergency? Yes, my parents are sitting here with blood everywhere crazy to think that two people in their house would end up being killed the way they were. With a hammer, of all things, seems so personal. They were beaten so badly that they first thought they were shot. Rumors quickly spread as to who could have wanted such a happy couple dead. There was an issue with the cousin. It felt like you have blood on his hands. Last thing I need is pigs coming around my house, and it's freaking me out. I still believe that it was Tiffany. At the center of the rumors was Charlie's own daughter, Tiffany, who claimed to have slept through the case that he will remember throughout his career. And this one's mine. The murder happened? 16 years ago tomorrow. And you were there that day? Yes. It was one of my first homicides as a detective, where the, all the responsibility was thrown upon me to solve this case. Well, we all read it. We're all excited. Us too. LaPorte is not the type of town that has a lot of violent crime. It's very rare. And so when you have a double homicide, it just gets everybody all scared. Well, show us the room. Let's go start You ready? Talking. Right this way. Why don't we start with y'all talking about the victims? Charles and Kathy Hayes, they were in their mid-30s at the time they were killed. And they grew up in LaPorte, huh? Yes. High school sweethearts? Right. And right. hooked back up later on. Charlie was a musician that had his own band and played in local bars and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. He had worked at a uh, small engine repair shop, and they had one daughter together, Samantha. Who was seven? Did you make a wish? Yay! Then Charlie had uh, another daughter that was living at the house named Tiffany, who was 16. <laughs> I got the phone. The whole thing. And was the only person the killer left alive. Was she so mad at her dad and her stepmom that she would kill them like that? Unfortunately, with the lack of evidence and police resources, the case went cold. I'm excited looking at this hammer because it's never really been looked at by the lab. Kelly and I have read over the entire case, but there's still a lot to learn. We've called in the big guns on this one, Houston homicide detectives Alan Brown and Johnny Bonds. With their help, our goal is to convince the district attorney to file capital murder charges on the person or persons who killed Charlie and Kathy. It has been 16 years and still no answers. At least consider her killing a cold case. Years later, the case is still unsolved. There are so many cold cases out there just waiting to be solved. The crime scene ultimately tells the story of the murder. We want to bring justice to these victims. bring you to meet some more of my people. <laughs> no, wait a minute. The whole state of Texas cannot be your people. They're all my people. They're all your people. <laughs>
Hey guys. Look who's in. Hello, ladies. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Yolanda, this is Tammy. Hi, Hi. Nice, nice to meet, to meet you. you. And this is Danny Jones. Hi, Yolanda. Hi, nice, nice to, to meet you. you. Every cop probably has a